hobby enthusiasts and miniature dorks. Um, I am here with another review, build, and paint. In this case, it's going to be a Skytrex um, Metal SDKF Z11, a late variant. I should actually hold this in the screen. Um, yeah, I wanted a late um, SDKF Z11 to tow um, my SIG 33 platoon. So, looking at it, it's actually um, quite a nice cast. There's a bit of flash which will file off quite easily. And uh, I'd have to say, this might be a newer kit too, I don't know, but the, uh, the casting looks a lot nicer than some of their older offerings. Um, so it's pretty good. Um, the cab is pretty nice, but once again, it's got that token um, flash right through the middle from the two-part mold. I think that is centrifugal molding, if I'm... I could be wrong. Um, but basically, it involves a two-part silicone mold, usually. So when they take it apart, you're left with that line. That being said, the line isn't too intrusive. I've seen some of their older kits where the line is, you know, impossible to totally sand off. But I think this one is possible to sand off entirely. So that's that's pretty good. And the pieces, you know, there's not too much to assemble this. Um, but the pieces fit pretty pretty nicely together. I still have to. There's little um, there's little bits of. Uh, metal splashing and stuff that I gotta file off for it to fit super smooth, but even even without doing that it goes together pretty nicely. So I imagine once it's all filed up it's gonna have fairly nice seams and it's gonna look pretty good. Um, and then the tracks. The tracks are really nicely cast. Again, I think this must be a newer cast or something because uh, the tracks look a lot nicer than <laughs> some of their older half tracks. Um, yeah, that's all I can say about them. They look nice. There's a bit of a, a flash or whatever, but you know, once it's glued on, I don't imagine you'll see any of that. And it also tells you which one is right and left. Um, which, you know, normally you're thinking kind of like, the because usually the drive sprocket is at the front, except for some British tanks or whatever. Um, but in this case, you can't really see super clearly. You can sort of tell what the drive sprocket is, but there's no sprocket teeth. So it actually is kind of good that it tells you, because once you get it cut off, it would, I think it actually would be pretty easy to put them on backwards. And we all know that that kind of sucks when that happens. Um, yeah, and then there's this back, you know, the, the truck bed or whatever you'd call this part. My brain isn't coming up with it right now. There's a little, there's some stowage molded inside, but I'm sure you could add some more. Um, yeah, so overall I would say that kit's a win. I'm glad I got that one. Um, so the next step will be to stick this thing together and then we'll paint them up. And until we get there, uh, yeah. put a coat of primer on these for the painting process so you can probably see a little bit clearer the detail because it's not glaring metal. So this particular uh, vehicle, SDKFZ11 Late, um, they were built by a few different firms. Of course I looked up all of this stuff because that's the kind of geek I am. Um, so they built these by a few different firms. Um, so I think the late war one, many of us are familiar with, had a wooden cab and a very different looking bonnet over the engine. Um, this one is a little more rare and I've only seen one actual picture of it. Um, but apparently, and this is, this is from what I've read, it, again it was kind of sketchy the details about this when I was looking it up, but uh, Apparently this version was initially for some kind of chemical warfare <laughs> um, purpose, I, I, I don't know what, um, but it, they ended up just being used as regular um, gun tractors. 
um, for all the same um, for all the same artillery pieces that any other SDKFZ11 would have towed, and the SDKFZ11 also has the same um, running gear as the the 251 series, the um, personnel carrier half tracks. Um, yeah, I just added some of my own stowage to it to give it a little bit of variety um, and personalize them a bit. The the primer I use is just your basic, especially for metal stuff, I just use basic, you know, in Canada it's trim clad, you know, metal, it's wood, metal, and plastic primer. Um, but I give it a zap with that and I let it um, dry for days. Um, just because metal kits, sometimes the paint comes away. Um, I also wash these things. Some people are like, oh, I don't wash it, and it's fine, but I, I, phew. again, if you see the surface between something that you've washed and something that you haven't washed before you paint it, you see a dramatic difference just in how clean the surface is, but also most of these things have some kind of a release agent. I'm not actually sure if white metal kits do. They make them in a silicone mold and have like a centrifugal disc spinny thing that they shoot the metal in. Um, but what they do have is almost like this kind of white metal frosted slag or oxidation on the uh, surface. So before I wash it, I hit it with one of these, which is a brass, brass brush. Let me see if I have something metal here that I can... Here's a kubel. Get this out of the way so we don't get it covered with metal dust. But uh, before I before I even wash this with some detergent, I usually take a, a brass brush like this and this will take off that powdery thing and you'll see it's making it quite shiny. Um, but the, the surface is so pitted just by virtue that it's white metal that even though you shine it up um, it still makes a pretty good surface but it also takes off there's always on white metal um, these little I'll hold it up hopefully it's in focus there's always these little burrs here and there too um, maybe it's just like metal that's splashed out maybe they've pulled it out too quickly I don't know where it comes from but there's often like these tiny little burrs so if you don't get them off and you paint it you know, as soon as you handle it and, and knock that burr off, you're going to have all these little freaking white metal specks over it. So this wire brush takes all of that off, um, but it's brass. So it's not strong enough to damage the surface of the thing. And that gets it really clean. And then I wash it with detergent. And sometimes, depending on what you use, um, sometimes the detergent kind of dulls it down a little bit too. Um, but then I hit it with my, you know, my regular hardware store, you know, all-purpose primer and let it sit. And I've had no problems. Once these things are painted, um, I've had no problems handling them. And then there's all these, like, little metal chippy spots coming through. So you can try it and see for yourself. Or you can just say, oh, that's a bunch of balls. But um, definitely I clean my stuff up pretty well before I paint it and I haven't had any problems with my paint coming off. <clears throat> I think this review is actually going to also become a tutorial on how to do soft edge camouflage with a paintbrush and pastels. Um, and I'll also speak about other ways you can do this. You can buy these um, ground up pastel powders. I'm gonna mix these two greens to make a like a dunkelgrün and rotbrun. <laughs> um, so the method I'm going to use for this is that I'm going to mix this with some of this um, odorless uh, turpentine. Not turpentine. Don't use turpentine. Um, odorless spirit. Um, Mix it with this into a paste, almost like a paint, and then paint it on with a brush. And then when it dries, take a clean brush and just sort of work in the, uh, the pastel and you'll get that nice soft edge. And with a small brush, you can get for, you know, this is 15 mil scale. With a small brush, you can get a fairly intricate pattern. <clears throat> 
um, more so than with an airbrush, or at least a lot easier with an airbrush. Another method is to take a, a pencil like this, and I, I think I did a little bit on the bottom, and this is quite faint, but when you seal it with something, um, it'll get darker. I'm just going to zoom in and we'll let it focus in. Um, so these lines were done just by drawing them in and then I took um, some of the thinner, the odorless thinner on a brush and just sort of smudged it out. I don't know if we're seeing that too well. So it gives you a very faint line, <clears throat> but often that camouflage was very faint. Um, another method is to take these things called a smudge that the artists use for drawing. You can put the, the pastel powder on the tip of the smudge and then just sort of work it in with the smudge. I think there's some left on the end of this one. Um, and you just smudge it in and you can build it up in layers too if you want it to get darker. Um, <clears throat> I think the smudge works better with a larger scale though. You don't want to like smudge off your paint. Um, I think like on a 172 scale model, um, there's just more area to sort of work and I don't know, I just find that the smudge is better for, you know, a larger scale. But obviously with the pencil you can draw in very intricate um, patterns and just keep sharpening the pencil as you go. And these are, again, these are pastel pencils. And then you can come along with the smudge and, and feather it out with the smudge or feather it out with some of the paint and then later when that's dry zap it with some uh, like a gloss varnish or a matte varnish whatever whatever you use to seal your models I, I usually do the gloss thing because I like to put lots of decals and things on um, just to give the vehicles personality <clears throat> but that'll seal it in it generally makes it a bit darker too so I would go a bit lighter and and often quite faint lines will actually come out looking pretty bloody legit at the end of the day so for this like I said I'm going to get like a pot that's nice and clean and we're not going to make a lot you don't need a lot so I'm just going to take a little scoop like this I'm going to powder it up a bit it's quite densely packed so yeah about that much of this and then it's quite dark, so we're going to put some of the lighter olive in. I'm sorry if my lighting's shit. I can't seem to get a good handle on this <laughs> video stuff. <laughs> Doing my best. Hopefully you get the point, though, without it having to be, like, freaking super professional quality video. You're getting the homegrown version. You can probably find a you know, a more practical tool than what I'm using. Oh, there's a cat here and there. Let's get him out. Yeah, but you do want to control it because you don't want to waste. I think this stuff is a little pricey. It might be like 10 bucks or something for a puck of of this, um, what you might call it, stuff. Um, Pan Pastel Artist Pastels Ultra Soft. There you go. And then we're going to get our odorless thinner, which probably is worse because you don't smell it destroying your brain cells, but hey, at least we'll have some really cool German freaking camouflage. And I'm just going to use an eyedropper and just carefully drop that in. And we're going to make it into a bit of a paste before we paint it on. So I'll just use one of these brushes and just sort of mix it. And it looks quite dark now, but obviously it's going to lighten up quite a bit when it dries. Although looking at it, it does look quite dark, so I'm going to add a bit more of the lighter green. Having a real issue with my camera battery today too. It keeps... the charge doesn't last very long for some reason. It's kind of making me a little bit crazy. So if I go crazy, that's why. The other thing you'll want to do once you get your pastel stuff sorted out is wash your hands so you don't transfer your pastel onto your 
vehicle. Now my paste has gotten a little thicker, but I think that's okay. And it's a bit lighter. I think it's going to go even lighter when it dries. So now that I have my green mixed up, I am going to go and wash my hands. I don't know what I did with my cleaning rag. So I'm going to go wash my hands again because I don't want to transfer the dust onto the vehicle and then we'll pick it up from there. So we're going to let this focus in. Okay. So I've done lots of little lines and things recently in my painting, so I think for this one I'm going to do like blotches. But my blotches are going to be a little bit more intricate than, you know, just regular blotches. You know, I'm going to have like shapes like so. Okay, so I'm almost done my green, and you can see in the areas where it's dried that it's gotten a bit lighter, the paste, and a lot of that's going to come off, and it's going to be even lighter when it's all said and done. Um, so you can see with the brush, you can get a much, um, you know, a much finer sort of, you know, like good luck trying to get these blotches in 15 mil to have like all this shape. Um, Although I'm not a very good airbrusher, so maybe there's some of you out there that can pull that off with an airbrush. I'm talking with a brush in my mouth here. Put that down. But, you know, with a paintbrush, you can get like a, a blotchy shape and sort of put it in as if it was an airbrush. You're, you know, like the compressor um, spray gun that the Germans used, for example. <clears throat> put on your blotches. Um, the other thing that you would have an extremely difficult time doing with an airbrush is getting like inside, inside here um, and all these areas, like good luck getting like a nice tight looking um, camouflage pattern in there. So it's really beneficial, especially for the small scales, but even for like, well, I mean 172 is a small scale. I used to do 172, but now I'm doing 50 and I'm like, oh, that's really small. But yeah, this this works really well for 172. And in fact, even even for your like 28 mil and, and, and larger, which when you're doing like intricate, tight camouflage patterns, this will work and it really looks sprayed on when it's done. So I'm gonna continue on. I'm gonna put all the green blotches. I'm, I'm doing these SDKFZ11s and they're gonna be toes for these um, SIG 33 uh, infantry guns. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing, oh yeah, another thing I want to mention, you got to keep mixing this as you go because it's it, it's more like a paste than a paint what you get. Um, so when the, when the, um, when it starts to separate from the thinner, you want to mix it up because the thinner will bleed out and almost act like a wash and then it's going to be harder to control tightly your colors. Um, so yeah, remember to give it a little mix here and there. You might need to add thinner if you're doing a bigger job. Um, and that's all here. I'll come back when I'm about ready to fluff up all these green blotches. All right, so I've put on my blotches and I've um, 
use the paintbrush to wipe off the excess and it's quite powdery. So there were areas where the powder kind of accumulates and it looks kind of dirty. And I just went in with more of the base color on a small paintbrush and painted those areas out. Um, and you can kind of notice it now, but once you uh, do all the weathering that's going to come, th those areas all blend in really nicely. And so, yeah, that's, that's basically it. I'll show photos of the final product after it's, you know, been weathered and, and painted. All right, well, we've come to the end of this thing. What was supposed to just be a um, review ended up being a bit of a tutorial. Oh, well, what can you do? Just got to be spontaneous, I guess. So here's how these babies turned out. This is how the pastel powders end up looking. Hopefully this is staying in focus and I'm not spinning it too quickly. I added uh, license plates. I think I added the wrong one though. I think it should have been the square one, but oh well. Fug it. That's what this one has. And I added one on the front. So when you have these um, 15 millimeter kits, Often the area for the license plate isn't adequate for any of the license plate decals. Um, Skytrex makes some, I think I-95 Enterprises make some. Uh, anyway, what I do is just put the decal on a piece of sheet plastic and then I trim around after the decal is set. Um, and then I crazy glue the um, sheet plastic with the decal in place and that ends up being nice and then you don't have to try to fit the decal in an area where it either doesn't fit well or perhaps there's not even any room for it so this will be the conclusion of this video what i'm going to do is put a bunch of pictures at the end showing different uh, camouflage patterns i've done with the pastel powders um, using the paintbrush um, and then my I usually have a little bit of a, a critique of things when I'm done things that could change or do better and what I'm still trying to work out with the with the chalks I, I think it's a good um, method but I think it could be developed better you know the amount of um, powder to um, uh, God, what am I saying? The amount of powder to the amount of um, odorless thinner. Um, because I think I end up, it's too powder heavy, so when you go to like brush it off, it makes a bit of a mess, and I have to go in and clean up some of the Dunkelgelb areas. Um, so if you were going to try this at home, I would recommend maybe practicing on something first and, and see how, how you get with different... Uh, levels of, of thinner to powder. Um, I mean, you want it to go on fairly stark, but maybe you don't. Maybe if it goes on very lightly um, and then you brush it out, it, it might have a nice effect too. So I'm going to obviously keep on with this technique, um, especially with things like, like soft skins and stuff. I, we use these in our games. They're not really like super important. I just like them. Um, I just like having the right vehicles to go with the guns and everything. So I do a lot of these things and it's uh, it's just quicker and it looks nice. Um, so yeah, we'll move on to pictures and stay tuned for more greasy adventures uh, and reviews and whatever. All right, bye for now, fellows. Take care.
Bye for now friends. Thanks for watching.